Hello, good morning, and this is Taib at Taibs.com, and today we're going to look at Genesis 20, verse 1 to 7, and the title of the message is The Righteousness of God. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to give you a background, and then we're going to jump into what this means to us today. So let's go into the background. So basically, um, Abraham and Sarah had been told in Genesis 18, that they will have a child and that's when God visited them and God came with two angels and then from then on he went to Sodom to destroy the city so what I want you to remember is uh, Abraham and, and Sarah were both well advanced in years and Sarah was past uh, the childbearing age so the child that was that was going to be born was purely from the word of God by faith so he was called the child of the promise Isaac so now, Abraham had been tested by God on several occasions. He failed some of the tests and he passed uh, some of the tests. And then now he, he was going to be tested again for, for the nth uh, time. So what he did was he went into the territory of the Negev where Abimelech was king of Gerar. And as was his custom, he told Sarah to pretend she was his sister. Now, Sarah was technically Abraham's half-sister. But they had been married for years and they were both like well advanced in years. So the reason why he did it is because he didn't want to die because he felt like they were going to kill him. So he told her, hey, pretend to be my sister so they can take care of me. So again, he basically put his wife in jeopardy and God intervened miraculously to preserve Sarah from being violated. And as we're going to go to Genesis 20, I want to zero in on verse 7. Scripture says, now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So basically, God issues a strong warning to Abimelech in a dream. And so we are going to explore this passage today, and we're going to see how it relates to the righteousness of God that he bestows on his chosen ones. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to read the scripture. And then we're going to go and then piece it uh, verse by verse. So Genesis 20, verse 1 to 7. From there, Abraham journeyed toward uh, the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shor, and he sojourned in Gerar. Now Abraham said of, said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. Basically, scripture says Abimelech had not slept with her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. So they both uh, concocted this, this lie. And the scripture says, in the integrity of my heart, and the innocence of my hands have done this. Then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return to the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall leave. But if you, don't, if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. And this was the verse of our focus. So now what we're going to do is we are going to piece this like verse by verse. Now the first thing, what we read in verse 1 and 2, from there Abraham journeyed uh, journeyed toward uh, the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shor, and he sojourned in Gerar. In verse 2, and Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. So what, what are the observations? Now, the people of the Negev were pagans. They did not believe in the God of the Hebrews. They did not believe in the Lord. So Abraham's concern for his safety was legitimate. I'm not going to say he wasn't legitimate because he was. So, But the thing is this. It wasn't the first time that Abraham had told Sarah to lie about their relationship. So we're going to go to Genesis 12, verse 10 to 20, and we're going to read about it. So let's read Genesis uh, 12, 10 to 20. Now, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, 
I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that you may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was indeed very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake he dealt well with Abraham, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now, think about this for a second. Pharaoh probably laid with Sarah. You know, he had probably, she became his wife basically because scripture says, and for her sake, he dealt well with Abraham. So this has gone on for, this had gone on for a while. And God finally intervened. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, in the back of your head. Now let's go back to what we are reading today. So we just read Genesis 12, 10 to 20. So Abraham Abraham had, and Sarah, they had made that agreement before, and some believe that Sarah might have been violated, and I think she was. And God intervened and afflicted the people in order to save uh, Sarah, while Abraham was enjoying the felicity of Egypt. So there is no indication in scriptures that he was bothered by the fact that his wife became Pharaoh's. I, I don't read that in scripture. So imagine how Sarah felt, her self-worth, like this was crazy. Imagine your husband basically says, hey, pretend that you're my sister. And then she goes and leaves with another man. In the meantime, Abraham gets all these benefits. Okay, and finally God intervenes on behalf of Sarah and he saves her from that place. Now fast forward, okay. Several several years later, they're both like pretty old now, like nine, probably 99 and um, Sarah was probably 90, okay. And God had just given them a promise that Isaac was going to come. So after all these years, Abraham still hadn't passed that test. He was jeopardizing his marriage again. But even worse, he was now jeopardizing the plan of God. God had announced that both Sarah and Abraham were going to have a child, Isaac. But because of his fear, Abraham was literally interfering with God's plan by putting his wife in a compromising position. Think about it. God has just told them, listen, you're going to have a child next year at this time. So now he goes into the territory of the Negev and in Gerar, and now he pretends again that Sarah is his sister. And now uh, the king of Gerar, Bimelech, takes Sarah home. And now he's now putting God's plan in very bad, in a very bad place because now God said, I'm going to bring a child. Now imagine what would happen if Abimelech had been with Sarah. Keep that in, in the back of your head and let's keep going. So, verse 2 to 3, And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. So, basically God intervenes to save Sarah and to preserve her integrity by sending a strong warning to Abimelech in a dream. Now, had Abimelech laid with Sarah, people would have probably questioned who Isaac's real dad was. They would have questioned it, okay? Now, do you see the gravity of the situation? So, I want, I want you to pause for a second and talk about, let's talk about Mary, okay? The mother of Jesus. Many people have, questions, uh, have questioned Mary's integrity, accusing her of being unfaithful to Joseph or them being together before they were married. Now, if God preserved the integrity of Sarah, because of, because of Isaac, how much more do you think he will preserve the integrity of Mary because of his own begotten son, Jesus? You see what I'm saying? Like, if this is how much God cared about Sarah and Isaac and his plan. How much more do you think he puts value on Mary and the coming of Jesus Christ, his own son? Because when people talk like that, this is blasphemous. They need to be careful. Now, what I'm saying here is this. You see that God intervened 
where Abraham failed because God wanted to preserve the integrity of his plan. No one is going to mess with God's plan. He was going to bring Isaac and Abraham was basically putting his wife in jeopardy. But at the same time, he was also jeopardizing God's plan of bringing Isaac. This was a dangerous situation. So we read in verse 4 and 6. Now Abimelech had not approached her, which means he had not touched her or he had not been with her sexually. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the, in, in the innocence of my hands, I've done this. Then God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you've done this in the integrity of your, in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God took this personal. Abimelech's heart was softened because the Lord softened his heart. He didn't resist the word of the Lord as Pharaoh did. See, hence the Lord kept him from sinning against God. You see that God took it personal, like I said. God said, it was I who kept you from sinning against me because God was about to bring Isaac and that would have completely destroyed the integrity of Sarah and the integrity of Isaac and everything else. They would have questioned his paternity. Okay, so God's plan will come to fruition and no man can twist it or thwart uh, the plan of God. So the Lord was gracious to Abimelech. Now the next verse is the verse of our focus, the verse 7. So far all we've seen is that Abraham failed the test and Abimelech was kept from sinning against God and Sarah's integrity was preserved. Now what about Abraham? So far there's no mention of him and we're going to read what verse 7 says. Now verse 7 says, Now then, Return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read verse 7 the first time, I was completely flabbergasted. Because I'm thinking, Abraham was responsible for the problem that had taken place, yet God called him a prophet. And God actually commanded Abimelech to go to Abraham so he could pray for him so that God could refrain from killing him and the entire people of Gerar. Now, keep that in mind. It just didn't make sense to me. Like, I was thinking, okay, what is going on here? I thought to myself, is this how God rewards a sin? Okay? I guess, like you know, we read in Romans, let us sin so that grace may abound. But God forbids. I realized that I misunderstood what was taking place in this verse. God was actually showing how he grants his righteousness to those who don't deserve it. Okay? And he also showed in this verse that he disciplines those whom he loves. And we'll see how he did it. Keep that in mind. God's righteousness. See, scripture says, Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. Okay? So if Abraham had been able to preserve Sarah, then he would have had something to boast about. First of all, he did not trust God. That means he put, he trusted in his own ability to, to, to kind of make up stories to preserve his, uh, to preserve his life. So he did not trust the Lord. So had he been able to like protect Sarah, he probably would have been bragging and boasting about it at some point. But here, God declares him a prophet, a righteous man based on God's own word. It wasn't Abraham. Abraham didn't deserve to be called a prophet. It's by God's word, God's own declaration. God said he is a prophet based on God's own word. Okay? Abraham didn't call himself a prophet. The Lord declared him a prophet in keeping with Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9. Scripture says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Abraham could never boast about anything. He was justified by God's word, not his works. Okay? Now, this isn't a license to go on sinning so that grace may abound. And I'll show you why. I want you to put your thinking caps on for a minute. Just think about it. Imagine, Abimelech comes to Abraham and said, The Lord said, You are a prophet and that you pray for me and I will live. Now, I want you to think about Abraham's prayer to the Lord. What was he like? Do you think Abraham went to God in prayer and said, God, I want you to forgive Abimelech because he took Sarah against my wishes. No, 
Abraham was facing his own shame and his own failure. Because I don't think Abraham had to actually, Abraham probably prayed first that God would forgive him for what he had done. This is the second time he did it in Egypt and now he's doing it again in Gerar. So basically, I'm sure his prayer went like this. Oh Lord, please, I'm a wretched man. Forgive me for I don't deserve your grace and your mercy. And I'm a man of unclean lips. Forgive me for what I've done because I failed to preserve my wife and I failed to preserve the integrity of your plan. So please forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for what I've done. I'm ashamed and I confess my sin before you. I know I failed you and I know that what I've done was completely unacceptable. But Lord, because you are gracious, you forgave me and you declared me righteous in your sight by your own word. So forgive me and enable me and strengthen me so that I don't do this again. Now, Lord, please, may you forgive Abimelech. May you also heal him because I know that I have done this. But please, because you are gracious, forgive him. This is probably how Abraham's prayer went. I don't think he went there and said, Hey, Lord, forgive him for he took my wife. No, Abraham had to face his own failure. And he, then he understood the righteousness of God because God imputed him with a righteousness that was foreign to Abraham. He wasn't Abraham's own righteousness. God declared him a prophet. Okay? So he had to face his own failure and he repented of it. I'm sure he repented. Okay? This, there's no way Abraham could tell God, forgive Abimelech for taking my wife. There's no way. He first had to ask the Lord to forgive him for not protecting his wife. Remember what scripture says in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to preserve her, in order to make her holy. Washing her by the washing of water with the word that she might be holy and blameless in his sight. Abraham didn't do that. He didn't, uh, he didn't, like the scripture says, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. He didn't love his wife as Christ loved the church in order, in order to make her holy by giving him his, himself up. Abraham didn't do that. He gave up his wife for his own safety. He did the opposite. So I'm sure when he was praying, he faced that and he repented of it. So I'm sure it was probably one of the, one of the hardest prayers Abraham prayed. And I don't think he had a cavalier attitude as if God was rewarding his behavior. So don't read the scripture and misread it because God was doing, killing basically two birds with one stone there by presenting this to Abraham and say, what are you going to do about yourself? And then now God gave him the strength to admit his sins and to be forgiven and to be declared righteous in God's sight based on God's own word. And that's what I wanted to focus on. So what can we learn? What do we learn from this? The scripture says, God leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's uh, Psalm 23. And God will always preserve his integrity. Integrity. We are declared righteous not because of what we've done, but because of what God has done and because of God's own word. And our righteousness has been imputed to us. There is absolutely nothing we can do to earn a right standing before God apart from God himself accomplishing that on our behalf. And God does not encourage sin, but he uses our failures to point the weakness of the sinful nature and his inability to please God. I'll read that again. God does not encourage sin or rewards sin, but he rather uses our failures to point the weakness of our sinful nature because we are unable to please God in the sinful nature so that we may fully rely on his spirit. And that's what I believe was taking place in this passage. God is now in the business of rewarding sin. So when you read that story, understand that what God was doing was he was first showing that apart from him, we cannot do anything. This is what Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. And Abraham could not preserve the integrity of his wife and the integrity of God's plan apart from God himself intervening and declaring Abraham a prophet. So God had to come and work in Abraham in that process. And I'm sure Abraham learned a lesson about righteousness. Because the righteousness that we have is a righteousness that has been applied to us by God himself. So we take no credit for it at all. It's all God's work. So I want you to really zero in on that. And then go back again and, and read it again yourself. And then see if uh, the Holy Spirit himself enlightens your mind to understand this scripture. Okay? Have a wonderful day. And I'll see you next time for another study. Thanks for watching.